so be sure to invite someone to come with you. Have you ever considered joining the choir? Now is the perfect time to join as we prepare for Easter Sunday. Rehearsal is this Wednesday at 6 o'clock p.m. in the Music Suite. All ladies are invited to join us on Saturday, April 6th at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall for our Women Together Spring Event, Preparing to Meet Our Lord. Several ladies will share their personal testimony and how they are preparing to meet Jesus one day. You can purchase tickets in the lobby right after service today or visit our website. Tickets are $10 each and they include breakfast, snacks, and a devotional book from Ann Graham Lotz. The Florida Baptist Disaster Relief Lunch will be held on April 14th in the Family Life Center directly after the worship service. This is for all current volunteers and all those who may be interested in becoming a volunteer. Please RSVP on our website by April 10th. Mothers and sons, join us for an evening of food and fun on Sunday, April 14th from 4 to 6 p.m. There will be Nerf activities and nachos to snack on, plus a lesson from Joshua 1-9. Please RSVP on our website by April 7th, and this event is for kindergarten through fifth grade. As always, don't forget to stay connected with us each week through our social media pages, our website, or stop by the Connect Desk in the lobby for more service opportunities. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. God's people said, Amen, Amen. Well, on behalf of Dr. Craig Connor and the staff at First Baptist Church, we want to welcome you to our 
uh, triumphal entry service as we celebrate the Lord's Day. Pastor Connor is going to give us a, a great message today from God's Word about the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ in fulfillment of Scripture, and we're glad you're here. We would like to uh, invite you, if you are a guest, to fill out the information card in the pew in front of you. If you would reach down and take one of those cards and fill it out and place it in the offertory plate later in the service, we'd love to have a record of your visit. Or you can take it to the Connect desk after the service and also pick up a gift for uh, first-time visitors. We uh, also would like to ask you to stand up and welcome one another in the name of the Lord. This is an exciting time as we celebrate the triumphal entry of our Lord. to his name this morning. Amen. Thankful this morning for the blood and the cross of our Jesus. Amen. The blood is the cleansing agent that washed away the sins of the entire world. Can you say amen to that this morning? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's sing together this morning in Christ alone. All of our faith, hope, and assurance of the one true God is Christ. Would you sing together? Oh, my 
amen. Thank you so much, Brother Gary, and uh, thank you for that opening orchestra special. And that uh, guy on the trumpet, not sure who he was, but he did a great job. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Gary, as he was practicing this week, he struggled with some of those parts, and I worked closely with him, <laughs> got him through it. And, uh, we appreciate that. Well, next Sunday, of course, Easter Sunday, a uh, great day, two services, 8.30 and then 10.30, and um, the word for the week is the word invite. Invite, 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 invite. Everywhere you go, invite. Hand out some of those little cards that uh, we have printed up that will invite people to come and worship with us. People are open for an invitation to church on Easter. They are expecting it. And so let's just flood Bay County with invitations to come and worship with us uh, next Lord's Day. At the conclusion of the service today, we will be uh, observing the Lord's Supper. We do it just a little differently around here, but the plate will be passed to you. If you have uh, a gluten intolerance, we have gluten-free elements. So if you would just raise your hand as the plate is passed, then uh, our deacons will make sure that um, your needs are met. But as the plate is passed, you will have two cups. Can you see that up there? Yeah, you have two cups. And um, you'll pull that top cup out, and the wafer is in there, and the juice is in there. That really expedites it as we are uh, passing out the elements through the service, but it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful experience as we conclude our service today with uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper. Um, I need to make an announcement. Probably most of you have already heard, but our campus pastor at the Youngstown campus, our north campus, Brother Joe McClendon, went home to be with the Lord this past Wednesday. He was at church preparing for Bible study on Wednesday night, and uh, the Lord took him home. I thought, wow, what a way to go in church, preparing to teach the written Word, and boom, all of a sudden, you're in the presence of the living Word. But we want to pray for Youngstown. Uh, we know that that congregation of believers, they are hurting. Brother Joe loved them. They loved Brother Joe. Uh, we want to pray for that church, pray for Brother David Flat, as he is there preaching this morning that God would give him the exact words that that congregation needs to hear. And then we want to pray for Brother Joe's family, pray for Tracy, pray for their children. Uh, the two sons, Jacob and Justin, are here with us this morning. And we want you to know we love you and we're praying for you. But man, um, what a place to be after what happened on Wednesday in God's house uh, to receive God's Word. Would you bow with me, please, as we pray together? And our loving Father, we have been so blessed this morning by the music that we have already heard. God, we thank you for the leadership of Brother Gary, for our choir, our orchestra, Lord, who so prepare our hearts for that moment that we open your word for you to speak to us out of your word. And God, we're grateful. We are grateful on this Palm Sunday to be in your house, to celebrate as the people of God. And our Father, we are so grateful for the privilege of prayer knowing that we can touch the ends of the earth with our prayers from Panama City. And Lord, we can touch the hearts of people in Youngstown from our prayers here at the downtown campus. God, we lift up that congregation of believers this morning that you would do something supernatural in their hearts this day. We know that they are grieving. That's normal, that is natural. We pray for the family. We know that their hearts are heavy. 
But we are so grateful that one of the titles of our Lord is the mender of the brokenhearted. And God, how we pray that that would be their experience this day and in the days ahead. Now, God, I pray for this time of worship that it would be a very special moment for us as a congregation of believers today. We have gathered in your name, in your presence to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we know that one of the aspects of our worship is our giving. And Lord, I pray that as we give, that you would bless both the gift and the giver, and that you would use the sacrificial giving of your people. Lord, just uh, help us to be able to proclaim the good news that Jesus saves around the world. In his name we do pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
Well, amen. Thank you so much, choir and orchestra, Sierra. Tell you what, after that, we could just say amen and go home, uh, but we're not. So, uh, I have a word that I want to share with us today, and um, there are two verses that uh, I want you to mark, John 11, verse 35, and then Luke chapter 19 and verse number 41, John eleven thirty five, and then Luke 19, verse 41, as we take a little break from our study in the life of Moses. This indeed is a special day in the life of our church, and really it's not just in the life of our church, but really it's a special day for Christian churches all across our world, as historically this is the day that we celebrate the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday, which is the beginning of the last week in the earthly life of our Lord. But it will also be a special day in the life of our church, not only because we look at that, but also at the conclusion we will receive the Lord's Supper in which we meditate upon Christ's death for our sins upon the cross. And what I want to try to do today is I want to try to take these two things, the triumphal entry of Jesus and the Lord's Supper, wed them together, and hopefully that will enhance our worship experience today. You know, when we think about Palm Sunday, what do we think about? Normally, what we think about is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. We think about the waving of palm branches. We think about a time of the shouting of great hosannas and praise to our God. We think about a time of great celebration. And really, we think about almost a pep rally type atmosphere when we think about Palm Sunday. But I today, I want to approach it from a little different perspective. And rather than thinking about the smiles and the shouts and the hosannas and the pep rally atmosphere, I want to talk about tears, the tears of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday tears. Did you know that two times in the New Testament, the Bible talks about the tears of Jesus. Two times it's recorded that Jesus wept. One other occasion in the book of Hebrews, it refers to the tears of Jesus over in the Garden of Gethsemane, but there are two times that it's recorded of Jesus weeping. And I believe that both of these are tied to Palm Sunday, primarily because of the location of those tears. On both occasions, those tears occurred on the Mount of Olives, one time on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives, the next time on the western slopes of the Mount of Olives. John chapter 11, verse 35, we read where Jesus wept, and that was a few days before Palm Sunday. That was on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. But then we read in Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, the second occasion where it occurred, and that is Jesus was when he was riding into the city for his triumphal entry. So I want to look at those two verses. Luke chapter, or John 11, 35, Jesus wept. But then Luke chapter 19, verse 41, the Bible says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Palm Sunday tears. Now, I want to look at tears from two different ideas. Number one, out of John 11, verse 35, the tears over our sorrow. Now, we know that within the context of this verse, we know that this verse is framed within the context of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And this is, we know, the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. 
And yet it may be the deepest verse in the Bible because it speaks of the person of Christ. And it tells us two things about the person of Christ as he raised Lazarus from the dead. It tells us that Jesus was God because only God could raise the dead. But it also tells us that Jesus was truly a man because the Bible says that Jesus wept. Now, there are many things that reveal the humanity of the Lord Jesus. For example, he was born of a woman wrapped in swaddling clothes, just like any other baby. The Bible also says that he grew in knowledge and in wisdom, that he got hungry, that he got thirsty, that he ate fish with his disciples there on the seashore. But maybe one of the strongest proofs of the humanity of Jesus is that Jesus, like us, Jesus wept, that Jesus had glands in his body just like us, tear glands. And the Bible says that Jesus wept. We know that Jesus was fully a man because Jesus experienced grief just like us. Over in the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 3, the Bible prophesied of the coming Messiah, Jesus, and said that he would be a man of sorrows who would be acquainted with grief. And friend, those words are such encouraging words when we stop and think about them. Because what that says is wherever we are, whatever our emotional experience might be, that the Lord Jesus understands it all because he has been where we are. Now, as we think about Jesus and his tears over our sorrow, two things I want to say. Number one is how Jesus wept. Now, I think that this is an important point because we don't see it in our English text, but we do see it in our Greek text. And the word that is used for weep in John 11, verse 35, is a different word than the word that we see in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 41. Down in verse 33 of uh, John's gospel, chapter 11, it says of Jesus, therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who came with her weeping, that he groaned in the spirit, and he was troubled. And then it says that Jesus wept. And the word that is used there is a word that literally means to weep silently. It would be kind of like us being emotionally moved, and we have a, a lump in our throat, or maybe a, a few little tears trickle out of our eyes and down our cheeks. That's the kind of weeping that is referred to here. You see, the Lord Jesus came from a land where there was no sorrow, there was no sadness, there was no heartache, there were no broken hearts, there was no pain, there was no death. And when Jesus experienced that, the Bible says that Jesus wept. You see, dear friends, something great about our Savior is that he is no aloof Savior that is just kind of separated from the daily stuff that you and I encounter in life. And when you and I commend this Christ to an unbeliever, we are not commending a Christ to them who is insensitive to the plight that they might be in. Let me ask you today, are you suffering? Jesus knows about it. Are you in tears today? Jesus has been there. Are you distressed today? Jesus understands what it's like. Jesus went on, and he overcame all of these things in order that you and I in him might be overcomers in these things. So number one, how Jesus wept. But number two, when Jesus wept. Verse number 33 to me is just so encouraging when it says in John 11, verse 33, therefore, when 
Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping. He groaned in his spirit, and he was troubled, and Jesus wept. You see, their tears moved God's heart. They were heartbroken. I mean, that they were hurting. And because they were heartbroken and they were hurting, Jesus was heartbroken and Jesus was hurting. Mary felt hopeless. Her brother was dead. He was hurting and her tears touched his heart. When Jesus saw them weeping, the Bible says Jesus wept. Did you notice that Jesus didn't lecture her because of her lack of faith? Jesus didn't say, oh, if you just had faith, you would not be shedding these tears. No, instead of lecturing her, for her lack of faith, he came alongside her, and he wept with her. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Can I get a witness? Friend, that is what our Lord Jesus is like. And I believe that on this Palm Sunday that we can safely say that Jesus is still weeping, and he is still touched by the hurts of his people. Friend, Jesus is not a spectator to our sorrows. And his tears, what what were these tears? They were an expression of his love for them. The Bible tells us in this context, back in verse number 5, that this family was precious to Jesus. Back up in verse 3, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, He whom you love is sick. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. This family was precious to Jesus. And can I tell you that your family is precious to Jesus? My family is precious to Jesus as well. These tears were just an expression of his love Friend, let me, let me correct a misunderstanding. Did you know that God's love for us does not shield us from the problems of life? Just because God loves us and just because we are precious to the Lord Jesus, that does not mean that we are shielded from the difficulties of life. See, the love of Jesus for us and the gift of Jesus eternal life to us and the blood of Jesus that covers us does not insulate us from the difficulties of life. And I don't care how godly some family might be, no family has walls so high that trouble can't climb over those walls and get into that family. And yet we have a great assurance You know, when we get saved, the Holy Spirit of God doesn't tattoo across our forehead trouble-free living. Doesn't happen that way. But we have one great assurance, and that great assurance is that no matter what, we're precious to Jesus. Think about that. We're precious to Jesus if we're sick. We're precious to Him if we're healthy. We're precious to him if we're glad. We're precious to him if we're sad. We're precious to him if we have money. We're precious to him if we're broke. And right there would be a good place for somebody to say, thank God for that. We're precious to Jesus if we're a believer. And get this, we're precious to Jesus if we're an unbeliever. Friend, there's one thing you cannot stop. You can't stop Jesus loving you. Can't stop that. Now, you can refuse that, but you can't stop it. It's kind of like the sun. You know, you, you can't stop the sun from shining. 
but you can be foolish and refuse to go outside and enjoy its warmth. Friend, why would anyone want to refuse the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord? You know, I think that his tears communicate something to us about our tears. It communicates to us, first of all, that he notices our tears. If there is one thing that is clear from this passage in John 11, it is that Jesus is not oblivious to our tears. Jesus is no different from the God of the Old Testament because he is the God of the Old Testament. And the God of the Old Testament noticed the tears of his people. Over in the book of 2 Kings chapter 20, Listen to these verses. In those days, King Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. And then he, that is Hezekiah, he turned his face toward the wall and he prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days 15 years, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city for my own sake and the sake of my servant, David. What did God do? God saw his tears. Friend, I want to tell you, God notices our tears. He's moved by our tears. Psalm 9, verse number 12 the Bible says that he does not ignore the cry of the humble. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cry. Job 34, verse 28, he hears the cry of the needy. Three powerful verbal phrases here. He does not ignore. His ears are attentive. He hears the cry of of the needy. Seems to be something about our tears that touches God's heart. The great Spurgeon said that our prayers with tears are liquid petitions. Tears have a language all their own that touch the heart of God. And yet are not you like me? That so many times when I encounter things that bring tears to my eyes and from my eyes, I think that nobody sees and nobody cares. God does. Third thing these tears communicate is that he remembers our tears. You know, normally we remember something that's special to us. I remember my wedding day. I was there. Don't remember much else, but I remember that day. I remember the birth of my three children. We remember things that are special to us. And King David gives us a verse, Psalm 56, verse 8, that reveals this truth in a metaphor. He was being chased by his enemies. They were seeking to take his life. They were slandering him. And King David out of nowhere said to the Lord, put my tears in your bottle. Put my tears in your bottle. Now the only bottle that David would know anything about would be a large leather bottle like Jesus talked about. He called wineskins. 
And what he was saying was, God, put my tears in your bottle so they will forever be with you and you will not forget them. That's what was being communicated. Wow, what an awesome idea. God collects our tears and long after we've forgotten them, God still remembers them. And somebody's going to tell me that you're not precious to God. He doesn't love you, that he loves you so much that he would collect your tears in a bottle. He remembers our tears. And finally, he removes our tears. He removed Mary's tears, how? By raising Lazarus from the dead. He removes our tears as well. He removes them now. Psalm 116, verse 8, For you have delivered my eyes from tears. Psalm 126, verse 5, Those who sow in tears, they're going to reap in joy. Psalm 30, verse 5, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. He removes our tears now. Now listen carefully. He may remove our tears by removing the cause of our tears, or he may remove them by giving us the strength to endure and be sustained. But he removes our tears now, and he removes our tears in eternity. Revelation 21, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth, they had passed away. And also there was no more sea. And I, John, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And you know the rest of the story, don't you? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Thanks be unto God. I know I'm going to a land where there are no more tears. I may weep now, but I will not weep forever. God removes our tears. And so we see his tears over our sorrow. But then we see his tears over our sin. Over in Luke chapter 19, verse 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying to them that he was weeping over, If you had known, even you especially, in this your day, that is your day of visitation, the things that make for you peace, but now are hidden from your eyes. For days will come, Jesus said, upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and they will level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave you and in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus riding in for this triumphal entry. He stops on the western slopes of the Mount of Olives. He looks into the city, and the Bible says he weeps. My friend, that's a different word than John 11, 35. Here is the word kaleo, and that means to weep and to wail with deep sobs. The Lord Jesus was sobbing uncontrollably as he was weeping over the sins of the people. But the question is why Jesus wept. Jesus wept as he looked out across a nation who had taken for granted 
there are many opportunities to come to Jesus. God had revealed to them over and over and over and over and over again their need of a Savior and that Jesus was that Savior. He had revealed that to them and yet they had refused and he wept. It's interesting to me that Jesus doesn't get mad when we refuse him. He weeps. Could it be that Jesus is weeping over someone in this room today? You've been to church time and time and time again. You know it all. You've heard it all. And there have been those moments when God's Holy Spirit has sat down on your heart and convicted you. And yet you have refused to come to him. And the Bible says Jesus weeps over you. He wept over their sin. Not a little silent weeping, but a sobbing. Oh, that says something about the heart of our Savior. He wept as he stopped outside the city. And he looked inside the city and it kind of reminds me on Palm Sunday as maybe he camps out on the outside and looks inside churches all across our world and he looks in and he sees all of the religious activity and the ceremony, but there's no spiritual reality of a personal relationship with him as Savior and Lord and Messiah. And the Bible says that when when he, weep, when he sees that, that, that he weeps. Friend, Jesus didn't come, die, and be raised from the dead to give us religion. He didn't do that to give us ceremony. He gave that. He did that to give us a relationship, a personal relationship with the living God. And then the Bible says he looked ahead and he wept. He looked ahead and he, and he saw what was coming. He saw the year A.D. 70 when the Romans would roll into town and surround the city and lay siege to it for 143 days and kill 600,000 Jewish people. He saw that and he wept. And, and what, what was that when that happened? That was God's judgment falling on them for their sin, and he wept. Friend, I want to tell you, Jesus is not delighted when God's judgment falls on a person because of sin. He weeps. And sometimes I've heard preachers preach on hell like they were glad people were going there. Friend, if we'd ever heard Jesus preach on hell, he would have done so with tears streaming down his cheek. And as the Lord Jesus looks out across his world today and sees a world rushing headlong into judgment, you know what he does? He weeps. He weeps over our sins. Why Jesus wept, what Jesus did. Would you not agree with me that sometimes you look at a person and you feel sorry for them? Maybe the plight that they're in, the condition, the circumstances. And you may even tear up a little bit. Sometimes we weep but we don't take any action. Jesus wept, but then Jesus acted. <laughs> because after he wept, four days later, he hung naked on a bloody cross to die for those he was weeping over. 
Why did Jesus act? Because it was God's love for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why did he die? Let me put a verse on the screen and break it down. For Christ also suffered once for sins. By the way, nothing else is going to be done to provide salvation for the world. Christ died once for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. That verse tells us that Jesus died in our place. He was our substitute. It was the just for the unjust. Jesus was the just one, holy, harmless, undefiled, innocent, without sin. And yet the just died for the unjust. We were sinners. That debt had to be paid. We were full of sin, rotten to the core. The Bible calls that depravity. We had already appeared in heaven's courtroom, declared guilty. And yet the just laid down his life for the unjust. Why did Jesus do that? Because God can't just overlook sin. God can't just say, well, it's no big deal. He could not do that and remain just. What would you call an earthly judge that just overlooked a criminal's crime? You would say, he's an unjust judge because the penalty was not paid. So this penalty had to be paid. How is it going to be paid? The just one, Jesus, died for those who are unjust. That is us. Friend, the only way we can get the hook of our sin off of our backs is to come to that one who paid our penalty. The Bible says in that verse I just read that he suffered. That should not surprise us because suffering always follows sin. Can I get a witness? Just as surely as night follows day, suffering will follow sin. Let's think about this as we eat the bread and drink the cup. Jesus suffered for us. Friend, th this was not just some theoretical thing. This was an actual thing where Jesus suffered for us. Did you know that what we would have suffered in hell... For all eternity, Jesus suffered in six hours on the cross. All of that was put on him in six hours. Physically and emotionally, Jesus suffered. Pastor, why did he do it? The verse tells us that he might bring us to God there is no other way to God. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the only way there. And all of the other false religions that proclaim there are many ways to God, they're a bunch of liars. One way to God. That's the only reason he crucified his darling son. Because that was the only way 
to God. And Jesus weeps over those who miss that blessing. You know, every time I think about the gospel story, there are two words that come to my mind. Not fair. Not fair. And it's not fair. The just dying for the unjust. It's not fair. You know why it's not fair? Because it's all of grace. Grace. We didn't deserve that. So all of the pain, all of the agony was all his. So that all of the blessings could be ours. What a Savior. What a Savior. What a Savior. I think one of the most interesting stories to come out of World War II was a story about a private, a young man, very young man, by the name of Eddie Slovic. And Eddie Slovic was executed before a firing squad because he deserted the army. And what is interesting is that all of that information was kept under wraps for years. And no one really knew what happened to Private Slovic, not even his wife. But then the story finally came out what happened. And there were all kinds of reactions, and there were all kinds of questions, and different opinions, disagreements. And really the whole thing was, wasn't there another way? I mean, could not he have been dishonorably discharged? Maybe served some time in jail? But to execute him, wasn't there another way? There was another young man in the prime of his life, 33 years old. Old. And based on the authority of God's word, there was no other option. He had to die to pay the payment of our sin. And friend, when you know that he willingly chose to do that, willingly, here I am, Father, send me. I'll do it. Boy, that makes us want to repent of the sins that crucified him and come to him and love him and have a relationship with him. That's what we think about when we eat the cracker and drink the juice. But before we do that, Maybe there is someone in this building today, you've been thinking about coming to Jesus. Stop thinking about it and do it. Our ministers will be down front to receive you. They will explain to you what to do, how that you can know in your heart when you leave this place, you're going to heaven when you die. Your sins are forgiven. Maybe God's led you to become a part of our church, and you want to join our church today. The invitation is open to you as well. But I want to ask you if you would stand and just bow your heads and close your eyes. Brother Gary's going to come, and he's going to sing. And as he does, if the Spirit of God's moved on your heart to make a spiritual decision of any kind, now is the time. So, Father, I pray now that your spirit would do what only your spirit can do. Convict us of sin and righteousness and judgment. Convince people today Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, who desires to be their personal Savior. And as you unashamedly went to the cross and died for us. 
may we unashamedly walk forward in this public setting to accept you. That person that you've been speaking to, that this is the church I want you to be a part of, God, I pray they would come today as well. For those who need prayer or need to utilize this altar to pray, may they have the freedom to come. In Jesus' name I pray. Our heads are bowed and eyes closed.